For those of you that don't know us, Appear here is the world's leading marketplace for retail. You can think of us a bit like Airbnb for retail space. Our mission, to create a world where anyone with an idea can find a space to make it happen, has never felt more relevant than it does today. And we want to do everything in our power to make sure that by anyone, we mean anyone. Today's conversation looks at the future of the fashion industry. This pandemic, for better or worse, has brought about seismic shifts in the industry, from supply chain disruptions to the fall of the department store, to ushering in the first digital fashion weeks. Featuring new voices alongside established talent, this event will dig into fashion brands, uh, what they need to know and how to navigate this new terrain. So on that, I'm very excited to introduce this amazing panel uh, we have for you on your screens. Uh, first is Hussein Suleiman, the co-founder of Daily Paper. Uh, Hussein founded Daily Paper with his two friends, Jefferson and Abdul Rahman. It started out as a blog where they occasionally sold t-shirts bearing their logo, but subsequently grew and amplified into a major trendsetter. With the ability to unite global communities across borders, Daily Paper is more than a disciplinary gradient and cultivated a community of individuals who celebrate their own roots and champion inclusivity. They've presented collections at Paris Fashion Week. They've opened their own stores in Amsterdam in recent years. They've launched a series of global pop-ups that include Miami Art Basel and London um, and soon a store in New York that's coming. So we're very excited about that. And thanks for joining us, Hussein. Thanks for having me. Uh, next, we have Clara Mercer, who's the Communications Director of the British Fashion Council. Clara's been part of the British Fashion Council for 12 years and has played a part in strengthening their network and platforms to connect businesses with global audiences, both trade and consumer. During this time, London Fashion Week has become a globally recognized platform for creativity and fashion talent, pioneering a gender-neutral focus and a pivot to digital from June 2020. More recently, British Fashion Council has launched the Institute of Positive Fashion as an engine room to change, to change, galvanizing the industry to address how it can be more positive uh, and, and impact the environment, community, and people. Next, uh, we have Bella Buchanan, who's the co-founder of WARN. Bella has almost 10 years experience in the fashion industry, uh, in buying, in marketing, in retail, working with brands including Nicholas Kirkwood and Galvan London. A strong desire to work with and create a platform for sustainable brands led Bella to launch Warn in partnership with Lily Fortescue, which seeks to offer the best pre-loved items from the most coveted wardrobes in London. Far from being a vintage shop, the store boasts previously waitlisted items from recent seasons they're in excellent condition. The purpose, simply to encourage people to buy better and upcycle their clothes. Thanks, Bella. And finally, we have this beautiful couple in the top left of your corner, Bessie and Oliver, Oliver Corral, are the co-founders of RJ. This amazing husband and wife duo um, founded RJ, which means the essence of everything, um, which goes beyond fashion to propose a philosophy of sustainable living. Conceived as one of the first see now, buy now luxury fashion brands, RJ was created as a reaction to the disconnect Oliver and Bessie saw in the fashion industry. Each collection represents, uh, is, rep sorry, is presented as a chapter to emphasize the continuation from previous seasons and available to buy two weeks after its launch versus the industry standard of six months. So very ahead of the time. Guys, thank you so much for, for joining us. I feel very honored to be speaking to all of you and, and excited to, to hear what you have to say on this future. Um, and I wanna start by talking about change. Um, change has been a defining characteristic in the last couple of months uh, with everyone from global household names to emerging designers, experimenting and testing new channels uh, and approaches. And I wanted to start by sort of a, a general question uh, about your business or you know, change your perspective on in the last couple of months uh, has been, and I want to start by asking Betsy and Oliver, 
um, I think this time has been really interesting because I think what we've seen across the board is about a language and what we like to call a universe. And I think this change in the industry and this idea of change in general has really led brands to really focus on what their language is. So maybe you were comfortable doing something, it was working, and now the pandemic has completely shifted that. And I think what we've seen is looking at if your language is strong, you can really pivot and create in any way, shape or form. It doesn't have to be limited to what you know, what your business has been successful in. So I think for us, that idea of change and language has been the most, um, something that's really connected and what we've seen other brands do as well. Like we've got friends who maybe had like more of a dress brand focusing on flowers and prints and they've created a flower shop and just really like pivoting beyond your core business, but always staying true to your language. Okay. Yeah, I would say, I would say exactly the same thing. I saw so to try to, I think what we learned in these couple of months is also to learn our fragility of the business and the industry and to be able to, to generate your own opportunities and own your you know, options to pivot and bring different options to the table as a brand, keeping mostly your identity and your, and your language, which is uh, probably is the most important thing as a brand. Probably not, not so easy as well, I'm sure. Uh, and Clara, from, from a different perspective, from the British Fashion Council and for the brands that you've been seeing, what, what, what have you learned, I guess, over the last couple of months? I mean, it's been a whirlwind, but um, I, I think the thing that I've been, I guess, most impressed by and most proud of is the sense of community. So whether whatever part of the industry we seem to be in at the moment, um, I think that that sense of community is amazing. So whether that's the designers with their teams, their supply chains, the people within their business, the people they rely on to deliver it, even, um, I guess, the landovers from a re retail perspective, being able to give breaks to people so that they can help pay bills. Um, I just think that that sense of community is kind of inspiring. Um, I think also people's ability to adapt. Um, I think there's a lot of teams out there who are nimble enough to be able to do so. And, you know, fashion is all about creativity. So we're in a creative business. Um, and I think the interesting thing is when you get creatives to work with new technologies, you get them to work and think in new spaces, actually out of that comes some um, amazing things. So um, the diversity in that has been incredible to kind of watch that unfold. Yeah, sure. Um, and Bella, you, you're from a relatively new uh, business, a new brand. Um, there's probably been a lot of learnings for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I agree. I think there's been such a huge focus on community. And as a small business, that's definitely helped us, you know, get through it and then also come out the other side of it. It's definitely been, you know, something we've focused on a lot as well from, a business, from our point of view during, during the whole crisis. I think from, from the resale side, it's just, you know, all the spring cleaning and all this kind of, you know, Marie Kondo, this, this whole thing that came up, it's made people so much more aware of the value in their own homes, you know, the value of what's in their wardrobe already. And, you know, we, we launched some really fun social media campaigns that encourage people to dig up and dig out their favorite pieces, you know, these, these incredible clothes that they hadn't maybe worn for a while instead of just turning to fast fashion, you know, instead of just going shopping and doing different things, kind of figuring out what they had and, and making the best of it, which I think in a bigger scope was what we were all doing in every aspect. You know? So yeah, it's been really interesting. And I think, you know, from our side, we've had a lot of first time sellers approaching us. So we've just got a lot more stock and it's been, it's been a great time for us actually. Okay. And the same from you from a sort of different perspective, you're a sort of fast growing, uh, you know, an international brand now, what, what's, what have been the key learnings for you? Um, the key learnings have been um, um, that you cannot control everything and uh, you can plan a lot. And uh, just to sketch an idea, um, I was working on building a store in New York for like over a year. Uh, we were supposed to open April 2nd and on March 15th, Trump made a press conference and said everybody from the EU is banned to, go, to enter the United States. And then everything changed. I was like, okay, all my friends who were planning to come to 
New York to, to, to be there for the opening, my partners, everybody. Uh, they cannot be here. Um, so are we still gonna move on with this opening or are we gonna wait? So we chose to wait and waiting eventually became more waiting and more waiting and eventually like months, months further, we're still not open because you cannot control everything yourself. That's one thing that I learned and uh, uh, I should have peace with it by now. <laughs> and uh, another thing that I learned is that our team is very capable of working from home. You know, we do not need everybody at the office in order for us to finish our collections, finish uh, selling our clothes or like uh, do our e-commerce or we don't need everybody at the office every day for, for uh, to have the business uh, operating. That's, that's two main things that I learned from this period. Uh, two positive things, I think. Yeah, very positive. And, uh, and I'm glad that I saw that as well. And another thing that I also learned is uh, because we entered like two very sensitive periods in this last uh, 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 five months, I think, since, uh, since the corona really started uh, hitting. Um, the first thing was the corona epidemic. And then everybody, a lot of brands were like, okay, am, am I still okay to push products, you know, on, on my online channels? And, and being so sensitive about that, or because a lot of brands would be getting called out because how can you be so insensitive? People need help right now. Like, why are you trying to push your product? That was one thing. And then the second thing was the, the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Two very important uh, changes happened. And for a lot of brands, they were looking at, can we post now? Can we not post? And um, what we realized is that in order for you to sell your collections or or, or or reach follower growth on your on your platforms it, it not, you don't necessarily always have to post sometimes being quiet and not pushing is actually the best thing that you can do yeah right. that's very true yeah i i, I want to on that note sort of talk about uh, change speed a little bit and talk about the the, the business of fashion um, and the sort of the, the fashion calendar i guess um gucci declared that the fashion calendar was obsolete and Saint Laurent is creating their own schedules. Alessandra Michel from Gucci said, clothes should have a longer life than that which these words, spring, summer, autumn, winter, attribute to them. Um, Clara, it's, it's a strong one to start with you, but do you, do you think the fashion calendars are obsolete? I mean, in short, no. Um, I do think that it needs looking at, and I think that this is like a huge opportunity to reset, and it's, this is not a new conversation. So. Um, been having the conversation um, and certainly Caroline Rush who's our CEO has been having the conversation about changing calendars what see now by now looks like um, this idea of everybody traveling around the world you know as a pack consistently it feels nowadays quite archaic especially as you just said to say and you can now do so much digitally and come together in new ways um, but there is a place for the fashion calendar and there is a place for this coming together to kind of share creative moments, share collections. And a lot of that is to do with logistics. So um, if every single fashion brand globally decided to do something in their own calendar at their own moment, actually the impact on travel and what was expected from media and retails would be actually be much worse. Um, so I think it's twofold, right? So you probably don't need six collections a year. Um, you probably don't need to do that so many times a year, but I do think that um, having a moment in the calendar where everyone collectively comes together is, is not a bad thing um, it needs looking at. Um, in terms, I think the more interesting way to look at it is in terms of drops. So the bit that's the most broken is um, the retail side of it. So like when things go into store, the fact that you want to buy winter coats when it's winter, not when it's the 1st of July, um, it's kind of thinking more about the seasonality um, and I guess the runs and the size of those orders. So actually I think the opportunity is there in terms of brands working for demand rather than producing a lot of product um, and then hoping someone comes to buy it at the other side of it I'm sh and lots of these business models with the guys on this call have addressed that um, from the ground up and you see that actually um, the British Fashion Council do a huge amount of um, business development uh, and work with lots of brands and the aim is to make lots of brands that are sustainable for the future um, and looking at new business models and most of the guys coming through 
have new ways of thinking, whether that's in terms of production or in terms of their sales schedule or whether it's direct to consumer or how they sell. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of innovation in that space and that's the opportunity. You know, like if we don't come out of this um, and use this as an opportunity to change, that would be um, a huge mistake. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, Bessie and Oliver, you, you guys have, you're one of the first luxury brands to promote the see now, buy now concept. Can you tell us like, you know, why you started it uh, and maybe why you think it's taking others longer to adopt? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I think it's really important to know when we did start, we used the term just to give the industry like a reference point to what we were doing. But it wasn't that that was our only thing we were doing as a business. So we're always really like we voiced that at the beginning that for us, to launch a business, we had a lot of experience both separately and together in the fashion and the retail world. And we really saw that when you're a young business, you have to fork out a lot of money for development. So a huge chunk of money goes out to creating a collection. Doing samples is a very expensive or time consuming process. And when you do launch that collection, it's not guaranteed that buyers are going to come and buy it. And rightly so, they need to trust a brand to know, okay, are you going to be here in a year? Like, are you the investment I should be making? And it becomes a little bit of a catch-22. And we launched just over three years ago. So we were saying as well before that over three years, we really feel the business has taken on so many different ways. Like, for, I guess for like eight years straight, there was one way that was working. And when we were working as designers in a brand, we could just keep seeing the same problems happening, that development is a huge overhead. And without the commitment of buying, you just sort of are developing for yourself. So when we started, we were really clear on, we believe in shipping in season. That was like our mantra that we were going to have summer and summer. We were going to have, we're really known for our like linens in summer and our shearlings in winter and really deliver our winter coats in December. And nobody could buy it without doing it that way. So because we had all these sort of ideas at once, we coined it under See Now, Buy Now, just to give it a framework for buyers to buy into. So then when we also were doing the development side, we really believed in our product. That was sort of our investment as a brand. We knew what we were going to sell. We had an audience for and we were going to sell it. So we thought, okay, we can develop a collection, be at the mercy of a buyer to say, no, I'm not going to buy you and wait for ages to have a business or start direct to consumer immediately have inventory available for a buyer to come in and buy immediately and then ship in season. So we sort of did the see now buy now to also grow our brand under our control and not be at the mercy of buyers or not be at the mercy of like needing to talk to buyers and say, okay, I know we, we know you love our brand, but we've got to ship in a different format. So that was our like starting point, but we don't believe it's the, the overarching like route to success it it posed difficulties like it's it's a difficult model to sustain to grow but it was our beginning point to say we're going to grow wholesale direct to consumer equally we're never going to be heavy on one side we're always going to have the two moving in tandem and we're going to develop in collections that we believe we can sell and then also with our manufacturers really guarantee that we were going into production with because also when you're a small brand a lot of great manufacturers don't want to take the bet on you because they don't know if you're going into production so we sort of narrowed our fabric buying to make it really straight and lean and narrowed our product assortment and then just went for production yeah and, I, yeah, and I would say that also going back a little bit at the beginning of the question about Sina by now, if it's a potential future or anything like this, I would say probably, probably not, or maybe it's an option, but for, for sure it's something that it is posed the product, the collections in real time. What we have been experiencing for, you know, for the last few years, mostly with obviously all this potion, social media wise, Instagram, Facebook, whatever, all the digital channels is that when you present a collection, it's a runway show, whatever it is, the, the, the actual collection is out there, it's available for everybody. Everybody's seeing it, everybody's, you know, seeing the runway show. I, I love look 34, I love whatever it is, but the actual product is not available until maybe six, seven months later. 
And during that time, it's available to everybody. And the problem, the product becomes really old. The problem, by the time the product hits the stores, hits the you know, online platforms, whatever it is, people have been seeing the product for six, seven months. So for us, it was also a way to sort of like a protect the, the integrity of the collections and the integrity of the product. Mm -hmm. Say, so we are going to create something that is gonna, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be overexposed and it's mm -hmm. gonna come to the, to the you know, sales floors and everyone is gonna hopefully receive it with you know, great you know, open hands and leave for the time that's supposed to leave. Absolutely. Just to add to that, sorry to interrupt, but it's also about the marketing spend, like putting on a show or launching a collection or the ad campaigns or you know, the imagery that goes into that is a lot of money, like it costs to do that. And yeah. so actually to make the most of that spend, it being direct to consumer means that you see the rewards. And I think that's something that um, is really worth mentioning. Well, yeah. 100%. You're saying you, you actually have a, a sort of balance between the two. You, you guys you do collections but you also do drops I mean, how, how do you think that the shifts in trends are going to affect you guys um yeah the reason why we we actually we we started as a wholesale driven brand um mainly because uh we needed the quantities uh to to actually start production and uh and writing like wholesale orders would really help you know get our quantities up to a to a to a certain degree um but like as we becoming uh more like our online platform is growing more daily and we now we also have our own retail stores um we do introduce products that are exclusively available on our online web store or exclusively available in our retail store and uh, it's going pretty well and it's definitely something i will want to continue doing and uh for the for the wholesale accounts that we have that do want to get with the new program, we also want to offer that to them. That's yeah. great. There has yeah. to be a balance, really. Um, but, but, but in order for that to work, uh, the, wholesale account, the wholesale buyers need to change the way they work. Now they, they, now they get like a big bag of budget for in a season. They, uh, they, they go to all these uh, fashion shows or like buying appointments and they spend most of their money there and they don't have a lot left for the rest of the season. Um, so then we then we can do two things like either wait for them or we can just offer it direct to our consumers and uh, the latter is uh, been getting our preference more and more i'm sure yeah. um bella you, you're a sort of it's a, a different speed for you is obviously you you um you're approaching things differently you you run a business that sort of encourages people to buy less how how do you run a successful business that that encourages that a very good question. I actually have a sign on my door that says exactly that. It says buy, buy less, buy better. And people do ask me a lot if I'm doing some kind of reverse psychology. But I think it's, I think it's really important. And actually, you know, persuading people to buy less and buy better comes down to two really crucial things. And the first one is understanding the value of an item and then also understanding the environment, the environmental impact of buying lots of items. So we really, you know, we really stress to our community that if you buy well and you care for their clothes, you know, you keep, they keep a value. So the difference between buying five tops, you know, for 20 pounds on the high street that will fall apart after a couple of washes, you know, at the end of that cycle, the, the items have no value. And when you buy a top that's maybe more expensive and if you couldn't afford it initially, we offer the opportunity to, to be able to buy it for, for a much better price. And you can wash that multiple times and you can wear it multiple times and it really, it looks great. It stays, it, it, it's, it's just a much better investment. And I think that that's just a huge thing that we've had to push in terms of changing that mindset, you know, towards wanting to buy tons and tons and tons of things to then just choosing those things you really need or want and, and focusing our efforts towards that. You know, I have, one of my favorite things is I have clients who'll, you know, they'll come in in June and they'll buy a dress for summer that they want to wear. And, you know, maybe it's for a wedding or it could just be something that they've fallen in love with that they couldn't have got, you know, they, they didn't buy in time or they were unable to buy the summer before. And they come in in September and, and they resell it. You know, they've worn it, they've loved it. They've maybe worn it once, maybe five times. And then, you know, they sell it again and somebody else buys it because they're going on holiday in October. And that, 
and I see the life cycle of these clothes and they understand the inherent value of these pieces. And it's just this beautiful circular chain that, that, you know, the longer that, you know, we've had the store just over a year and, and what's beautiful about having this community and what's beautiful about seeing it grow is, is really watching these pieces come back, watching them sell and actually understanding and seeing that the price doesn't drop massively. You know, once it's, once it's, bought in June, it doesn't sell for much less in September. And that's also a huge driver for people, you know, to really take care of these pieces. So, you know, and on top of that as well, I think us talking about the environmental impact of, um, you know, just, just doing that, that kind of compulsive shopping. It's just, it just isn't going to work anymore. I don't think, I don't think. Anyway. <laughs> no, for sure. I mean, Great. The mindset uh, and the, the change of mindset. I want to talk a little bit about um, Fashion Week and this this sort of we're in the midst of a virtual Fashion Week at the moment um, in Paris, and when for the first time designers are choosing to go digital or or fidgetal, which we kind of avoid. <laughs> um, and despite the fears, the the digital presentations have have been received surprisingly well. Um, and I know. Hussein, you guys created an immersive 360 virtual reality uh, experience that explores um, what it means to be African in your Spring Summer 21 collection. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, we work with a, a 3D artist to uh, actually uh, translate like all our pieces into 3D, 3D pieces on our models. Um, and we created like a virtual showroom. So all our buyers from all over the world, they could just log in and get like a slightly different experience uh, on how they usually use to buy our products. Uh, we do miss obviously like the, the sales, the sales meeting, the actually the, the, uh, the, uh, I say that the real life interactions and uh, because those meetings are always important. You, you always get to hear like the feedback the previous season, you get to hear, you know, their real, you see their real responses on your collection. Um, and I think those moments are always very important, but we try to do it to our best of our ability to create like a digital environment for our, uh, for our buyers. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there, will, there will be plenty of opportunities, you know, if we look at and try to embrace that digital fashion week, um, especially for emerging designers. Uh, Clara, do you, do you think the success of the digital presentations will sort of usher in a new, a new world in some form, maybe some combination of the two? I mean, um, I guess digital fashion isn't a new thing so much. So like it's been going on for ages. There's been various iterations, whether that was live streaming, um, shooting in 3D, there's all of these different versions. And when it's done well, it's amazing. And it really kind of helps take product. And um, I guess it allows consumers and people who would not otherwise be able to be there to be able to enter a designer's world. And I think we forget, you know, when you're in fashion, how amazing actually that is in terms of the creative process, what that looks like, you know, the models, the excitement, all of that can come into one place. And um, I guess these circumstances have meant that People have had to do that pivot very quickly um, and people are also you know are worried about budgets and there's a lot of considerations around what are the outputs what does it mean how do we how do we make this work for us so I think the exciting stuff I mentioned it at the beginning comes when we actually get to play with technology and creativity together and look at what an ideal solution for a digital um, output would would be. So like, are you making it as entertainment, as fashion as entertainment, or is it that you're doing it um, as Hussein did, as a wholesale tool? So how do you kind of get your buyers involved in as a, you know, as a solving a problem, right? So it's being able to take the collections to the buyers in a way so that they can see it, you know, in real life as possible. Um, I think that a hybrid is probably the ideal situation. Um, I think, you know, some digital experiences are amazing, but they have to be thought about with a new lens, okay? You can't just take something physical and make it digital. It's kind of, people are so used to consuming content online. So what does that look like? How does it make you feel? What do you take away from it? And um, so in answer to your question, yes, there are loads of possibilities. Yes, it's incredibly exciting. I don't think it's gonna go anywhere. Um, uh, I just think it's gonna develop. So the interesting thing is how does that happen? How do we use new technologies better to make that work? Yeah. For those of you or anyone that hasn't seen this, the, the digital stuff that Daily Paper are putting out, please check it out because it's, it's, it's really awesome. Yeah. 
Um, and also just to add, you know, uh, for those of you who are joining late, there's a QA. and a uh, feel free. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions at the end. So feel free to add uh, any questions to that Q and A. Um, changing speed a little bit. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about sustainability. Um, I don't think any conversation about the future of fashion can take place without discussing this. And um, I wanna discuss it both in the context of the environment, but also uh, building a business. So Bella, when you launched Warn in 2019, I'm sure a lot has changed. I mean, can you tell us about the shifts in consumer attitude towards choosing a, you know, to shop sustainably, especially in, in the luxury market? Yeah, I think there's been a massive, there's been a huge shift actually. And I think the shift was coming anyway, and it was, it was happening relatively quickly, but I think you know, the, the COVID crisis has, has accelerated it massively just because there's just such, there's such an overwhelming amount of information coming out about the, the detrimental impact of the fashion on, on the environment. And I, I think people are so much more, you know, they've had the time to absorb that kind of information. So that has organically led to, you know, led to a really big shift in, in the resale market. Um, I think on top of that, it's becoming a lot cooler. You know, I look at the younger clients who used to come in and or who do come in and, and I look at my baby cousin and I look at the teenagers nowadays and they're, they're very proud to be wearing pre-love. They're proud to be wearing secondhand. They're, they're proud of the finds that they, that they come across and wear and match together. And I think that it's, for me, that's so exciting because the younger generation obviously carries so much forward. And I think, What's been interesting, especially for us in store, is these these young girls are bringing in their mothers, who who six months ago, a year ago, would never have dreamt to come and shop. You know, at a secondhand shop, they don't need to, maybe, or they don't want to. It's just not cool for them. And and they come in, and I think if you present it in a different way and you frame it slightly, it becomes a luxurious experience. So I think. The, the, the shift is happening, and I think I think that's happening. You can see it in in social media with with the bloggers. I think that that you know what fed into the massive overconsumption of fast fashion, and the you know what pushed the luxury fashion houses way beyond their means was was this Instagram culture of wearing something once, never wearing it again. You know, going to events once, wearing something, and then never wearing it again. You know, the fashion weeks to everything and. And it's amazing, and I, and I used to be guilty of it myself, you know, and I think that now it, it just doesn't, have, it's not cool to do that anymore. And, and actually, it's, it's, gonna, it's a huge shift. And campaigns also, like the green carpet challenge that EcoAge launched, you know, they really took away the stigma of wearing something more than once, even on the red carpet, you know, and at the British Fashion Awards in December, so many of the models and influencers, you know, would, were wearing pre-love, they were wearing rented items, and so that was just, that was really cool. And I think that also London is, is we're so quick to adapt to things, you know, and I think that that's kind of put us really, as, as a city and as a, as a country, you know, it's, it's really put us on the map as being ahead in that way. So I think, you know, you look at even Kate Middleton, you know, she wears the same dresses and before people used to say, ah, oh, you know, she's wearing the same thing twice. And now actually there's this, there's an uproar of, of positivity when she wears the same dress two or three or four times. So I just think the culture is changing, the culture is shifting, and it's going to become a lot cooler going forward. Amazing. Um, Beth, Bessie and Oliver, you guys have been promoting timeless fashion since the beginning. Um, what, what does that mean to you, timeless fashion? So I think the, when we launched, we, were, we always had this like very conflicting idea of we want to be in fashion, we want to have collections. And I think the word collections is what always bothered us and this idea of a collection for a season and a time. So we removed that word from our language and from our vocabulary and that's where we led to the word chapter. And by like removing this idea of creating collections, we felt we were just basically giving our product like an endless shelf life to whatever we were creating. And we made it our promise when we design a collection and a chapter to make sure that from chapter one, which was our launch chapter, to what we're on now, chapter eight, everything keeps connecting and going together. 
So it's sort of like our promise to our client that we've designed a never ending wardrobe. And that's really how we approach it. Like if you look in our cupboard, you can just see a timeline and everything blends and moves together. And the most beautiful thing, I think what we started to feel was when our customer really adopted this language. So we've had a few pop-up stores. We've also done a lot of events in specialty boutiques and between like our direct customer and a customer within those specialty boutiques, they would come in like, oh my God, I've got pants from chapter one. Show me how I compare it back to chapter three, four, five, six. And then when you start feeling like the concept becomes so alive with the consumer, we were like, okay, this is, this is really the world of, and it's just been the most beautiful thing to feel like it was an idea. And now it's really reality. And now I guess the exciting part is we've always seen everything we do as a world. So it doesn't matter if we're doing homeware next year or towels, but they'll all live within the framework of that chapter and always have a place. So, yeah, we basically say our stuff should never go on sale. And if it does, it's an archive sale or it's a sale to help promote other things. But it's never a sale to have a time bomb and an end to a product. So, yeah. But and also it's, it's very, even if it's a horrible time, obviously, through COVID and so many issues. But it's at the same time, it's quite exciting to see how it's 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 a common dominate a common conversation yeah with the sustainable kind of aspect it's yeah. it's quite scary at the same time because there is so much marketing behind it but the truth is that it's definitely a conversation everyone is you know is is, is approaching and i think in, in we are trying to do i mean since the very beginning obviously with the concept of you know long you know long live, uh, long long term kind of uh, items that live almost forever is is trying to is trying to manage the waste Usually, the fashion industry we like it or not is a huge waste in since development to production overproducing units because you have to meet uh, minimum um, because you have to it's very sad but it's over a 30 percent of raw materials and whatever it is that you they're not going to be they're not going to be used for production so it's a huge underlying kind of waste that is very important to to keep in mind as a, as a brand as a mission to try to be focused and to say we are going to produce something that we really believe is going to sell and if it's sold out, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And it's, it's okay. Absolutely. I mean, you, you mentioned that this sort of, actually you all sort of touched upon it, this, this consumer uh, drive, really, the, the, the conversation. And uh, how much responsibility do you think the consumer has to drive change? So, you know, we've seen the impact of retail on, you know, from the Black Lives Matter campaign, which has been amazing. And, and you know, do you think we need, consumers to be held more accountable um for how we shop you know do, do you think consumers need to be driving that change um I, it's, it's an open field clara do you, do you fancy taking this one and um, i mean i think everyone has a responsibility yeah. right i mean that's right. kind of the short answer it goes both ways um, yeah. and so it has to be driven from everywhere um and i also think that people are doing some good stuff so i don't think people should be afraid to talk about the good things that they are doing in terms of change and it's a learning experience right for everyone um and i guess it is a global problem and um, it's something that everybody globally is affected by i um and i think so it, the way that we look at it is we you know we created the institute of positive fashion which is um, primarily about sharing information so it's a global resource it's about sharing information the idea is that, that is that there's no duplication and um, so that all of whether it is a designer looking to source collections or looking to source a producer or whatever these things are hopefully everyone can learn from each other and then make better decisions for their business to make better sustainable businesses what I mean by that is businesses that are sustainable in their growth rather than um, Kind of you know led by sustainable ethics but um so i think that's important um but to your question about whether consumers are responsible yes they 100 percent are um and our job is to educate them i guess about and how they and help them to make the right choices yeah i mean it's 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 true to avoid that sort of sustainable as a buzzword versus sustainable as like a how can you actually keep this company growing in a, in a kind of about growth isn't it yeah uh, Hussein, I know you you had mentioned to me that you guys meet once a week. Is it to discuss how how you can be uh, more sustainable? I know you guys take a lot of uh, uh, put a lot of energy into that. Yeah, I think like um, that all came from our team. 
uh, and uh, our team is like uh, the average age at Daily Paper is like 28 years and uh, the people that work here. So uh, they all are very proud of the company that they work for and they, they want they want to add to like, you know, like a better world. And so not long ago, like maybe like two years ago, uh, we started like doing this mandatory once a week meetings, like green meetings, where we would just talk about like how we could actually do better as a company and start like really at the office and like how we, uh, how, how, how we deal with all the wastage here, but also like, uh, like transform it all the way through like the way we manufacture. And, uh, when we started as that brand, uh, there was no factories that really wanted to work with us. We said like, hey, I want to make this very complicated design and I only want to make 100 pieces. And everybody was like, every manufacturer was like, no, I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to work with you. So there was also not the time to talk to a manufacturer and be like, how sustainable are you? And uh, do you, <laughs> like, we, like, we could not even ask set demands, but like as we grew and as like our units and quantities grew, uh, and we became much more important to these manufacturers. We could set certain demands on like how we want to close to be produced, etc. And that, that grew over the years. Uh, uh, we started mainly manufacturing in China, which is like far away from our main market, which is Europe. Um, but these days we do more than 80% of all our production in Europe. And, uh, and I think it's going to be more in the future. Amazing. Yeah. I, I want to, we're sort of running out of time, so I want to get, move on a little bit to, to the physical world. Um, and we've seen from, you know, the Nima Marcus is the JCPenney's department stores are set to become one of the biggest casualties of uh, lockdown. And I'm sure that m most of you guys on this panel have had interesting relationships with department stores over the years. Um, I want to ask uh, Bessie and Oliver, you know, how you think their demise will impact the fashion industry? And, and is there a role for the department store going forward? I think we're, um, it's again, like in two minds. I think the idea of a department store is like utopia. It's a beautiful concept where brands live under one roof. It's curated, it's edited, it's part of a community in a city or not in a city. But I think what we've felt more often than not is it's actually the business model within the department store that often can really destroy a brand. At the same time, it can really build a brand up because it's marketing. It's a marketing budget that you put forward. But unfortunately, a lot of brands with a lot to say don't have that available income to just spend on it. So we've, we've gone back and forth so much. Like if, if a department store gave more voice to brand and more space to brands, and at the same time really cared about their customer, then a department store would succeed because there is a place for it. But a department store more often than not, and this might sound like maybe a bit too aggressive, but sometimes you just don't have the best experience in shopping in a department store. And we've always said like, that's just not okay. If you enter into a building and into a space, you need to completely be immersed from the moment you walk in to how your product is packaged, to how you leave, to ex your experience post leaving. Like we went to the new Gallery Lafayette last year, I think last year, yeah. And it was amazing. Like it really was a physical experience. You can eat there, you can eat amongst clothing. The edit is beautiful, but there, there really needs to be like a respect to the brand and a respect to the customer completely equally for department stores to succeed. And if they don't do that, if it's just a, a bargain profit game, like everybody's going to lose. And a customer today, going back to your question just before, a customer today has so much choice. So they're just not going to choose to shop there. So I feel like it's if the department stores want to survive, we've always said they need to take care of the customer above and beyond and the brand. Like that's what they exist to do. Completely. And actually that's a good point. I, I, I sort of want to talk about, yeah, not, not just the department store, which has to, as you said, make that experience much more important for the customer, but, but sort of beyond the role of the department store, physical in general, I think probably has to yeah. do with um, Bella, what, what, uh, you know, why is stores so important for, for resale? I know you guys, it's the second that you could open your store again, July 15th in the UK, you opened the, that day. Yeah, yeah I, I think 
to me, the importance of having a physical space really comes down again to community and then to experience and touch and feel. Uh, you know, Warren was built, you know, based on a huge, I, I think community is, is so, so important in, in every aspect. And I think through having a physical space, that community grows much more organically and enables you to have conversations. It enables you to understand what brings people through the door and what their motivations are. It, it creates also an opportunity for us to actually talk about sustainability and the values, you know, that we hold and the value of luxury and, and our mission. And I think that I, I struggle to, to find that same connection online, you know, that you have in store. So for me, definitely, it's, it's very, you know, for our business, it's very, very important. We really also try to create an immersive experience in the stores where people can just have fun you know, <laughs> and feel really good because at the end of the day, there's no point in doing anything if it doesn't make people feel good and feel inspired. And I think this is, this is another huge thing that's happening with, with physical retail spaces. You know, and you see it happening more and more of those traditional spaces just aren't working and actually you've got to give people fun. You've got to, people have to be able to eat amongst, you know, the clothes and, in the department stores, it's actually something so important that's, that's grown. But realistically, for, for the resale market itself, touch and feel is also crucial. And I, you know, when people are buying secondhand, they want to know what they're getting. They want to see it. They want to touch it. They want to experience the piece. And I, I think it's, I think it's very important for us. For sure. I mean, who's saying you guys? I feel like are experts in bringing community together in physical space. I've seen even before it was cool, uh, people lining up outside your store. Um, how, like, is that something that you're keen to push on to, to invest in with physical space, even in spite of what's going on? No, I don't think so. I, <laughs> I don't think uh, queuing in front of stores is cool. I don't think, I don't think anybody should try to promote that. I don't think it's cool for the customer's experience. I don't think it's nice for the, for the neighborhood. I don't think it's nice for the people that run the stores. So. I really hope that is a thing for the for the past and and people just have like better shopping experience in the future. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, for sure. And 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 best thing, Oliver, you, I've been to your stores. They're absolutely beautiful. You guys, great. You don't even call them stores, actually. Homes. 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 Uh, like I know that you guys are shifting your your physical retail strategy. Can you? I know you're sitting in it as well. Can you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> it is it is a little premature, but I think um, they're going back to like what even Bella was saying and he's saying too, like the the experience like just cannot be lost today. Like to, to walk into a store and to walk into a brand store when you've got that luxury to have a store, you really have to like give it to the consumer. They have to feel the minute they walk in, like it's, we've always said it's hospitality. Just like when you walk into your favorite restaurant, they know you, they know what you like, they know the wine you like. You have to walk into that store and like someone has to feel like they can spend hours. And we ran our stores. so. We were very much present. We knew our customers. We knew everything about our customers. We always said we were like the therapists and the, like the travel guide advisors, like what to do, where to go. And that, that was the service that we wanted. We never wanted to someone to come in and feel they had to buy. Buying was like the last thing that mattered. They had to come in. And if we gave them like our favorite restaurant to go to around the corner and a suggestion of another store to buy something, we felt like, they had a great experience and that's all that mattered. But that feeling of trust, I think is what every brand today, if it's online, if it's physical, that's what has to be worked on, like caring about your customer. And if there's anything that's happened, even like in the pandemic, it's brands have become so much more human and that should stay. Like uh, you should feel the brand as a personality, a branch, if you're choosing to buy a brand, it should be like choosing a friend. You should love them and love everything about them. So. I think we've loved having the physical. It's quite hard for us not to imagine a physical space. Like, I guess that for us was like, we're not giving up on this idea. So we've shifted our energy <laughs> into, we, we actually, our studio was in our apartment and our apartment was our showroom. So we like ran everything out of our literal home. So when we weren't running a pop-up store, 
we were doing the same thing at home. So we had private appointments with customers. They could make an appointment by calling and we would host them in our home. Like they were just coming to a friend's house. Sometimes people felt weird and we were like, no, it's fine. You're one of us. Like, this is great. So we've now decided to renovate our home space and really make it an official RJ home. And we've yet to to exactly determine or um, like put a finger on what we'll do with the space, but it will be a space that is fully immersive in every sense. Like Ollie's like the most incredible chef. So we want to cook in the space, feed people, maybe they'll be able to sleep in the space and we'll rent it too. Like there's so many options that I think when you're a brand with a language and we would say to anyone that's a young brand or just like focus on a language because it's COVID today, tomorrow will be something else. Like there'll always be every year, like something that sets you back. And I think the, once you've got language, like you can just apply yourself and, and it's also really exciting to shift and move. And we were like, we're not giving up on physical. Like we need to, to see and talk to people. So. I have to say that one of the things that totally inspires me about you guys is when you have an idea, just go for it. It's, it's <laughs> I've seen these guys launch. How many stores have you launched now? Um, four. four stores. Yeah. And then other like showroom store spaces, but four were more stores. And, and that's like the inspiration to me is you have an idea, just go for it, try it out, see if it works and, and give it your whole heart. And it, and it's, and it's very inspiring. Um, so I want to, I want to just before we, we finish up, I want to continue with that positivity uh, and ask you all very quickly, what do you think the positive shifts are that, you know, are going to come from this? There will be opportunity. There will be positive shifts, both, you know, maybe either from for the brand itself or, or for the industry in general. I mean, Clara, do you think I'm, I'm just like more positivity from, from the British fashion? Um, I, I think that it's all out there for the taking, you know, like digital platforms are a gift for young brands, especially. Um, it's a massive opportunity for you to experiment, for you to get to know your audiences, to try things. Um, don't underestimate that. And when it comes to physical spaces, there's a lot of great business models out there, you know, Airbnbs for retail spaces, for example. Um, so there's a lot of good ways in which you can kind of work with brands and, and try things out before you then commit to big leases and try and do stuff like that. So um, I think looking, we've talked a lot about looking at your language, looking at who you are as a brand. I think that's vital. Um, be honest, you know, the word of trust came up. I think that's really important. So I think if you take this moment to like take stock, don't panic um, and like kind of look at what you want that to look like moving forward and who do you want to be as a brand? I think that's kind of amazing. Does anyone else want to take this question? I, I think that is uh, shown also positive elements with, within this crazy time. And is that uh, the, main, uh, the industry has three main elements, right? That is the, the, the supplier chain, the brands and the retailers, right? That historically they didn't talk to each other. They don't, everyone was trying to get the best profit from each other and etc. The suppliers getting the best from the brand, the retailers getting the best from the brand, the brand getting the best from everybody. So, and I think now is, is, is you know, obviously through this horrible time, I think it's, these elements, they're starting to talk to each other. It's really interesting how the supplier is, is talking to the brand. It's like, a, what should we do? I'm here for you. And the brands, the same thing with the retailers or suppliers. I think it's bringing this kind of, I hope, also bring this unity between elements mm -hmm. within the industry mm -hmm. that hopefully is going to bring a way more like a sustainable and positive kind of industry. I really hope so. That'd be great. Hussein? Um, I think like uh, the spirit show that... Uh, um, well, at least what I got out of it is that we can get better terms on retail spaces. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Like uh, we were actually in the middle of, um, we, after New York, we were thinking of opening a, a store in, in London, actually. And uh, we've been uh, in negotiations with a lot of landlords in the last two years in London. And it was a headache because it's very different than any other city <laughs> and uh, there's not a lot of uh, good spaces available especially in the areas we were looking for and after covid it was like a lot of spaces available <laughs> and, and we got like a lot more uh, better terms uh, than uh, than we would have got before that that's, that's 
question for sure. I actually have a question before I go to Bella. I have, there is one question that came through, which is, are you still planning to open your New York store? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, not in the way that we would, we, we thought we would open it. Like um, usually if we open a store or we want to do it with a big release event, etc. That's not going to happen. Um, and it's also going to be weird because it's, uh, we probably won't even be there when the store opens up because we're still not allowed to go to the United States. Uh, so that's going to be weird. But the, the, as soon as I can go to the United States, I'm, I'm definitely going to go first thing. Yeah. Your community, we very happy to hear that. Yeah. And Bella, what about you? Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> I was going to say, you have to stay in their new space, no? Yeah, you, you should come home. Can we all come and stay? Absolutely. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds amazing. Bella, there's lots of opportunity I know in that. Yeah, I think, you know, I think now's a really exciting time for everyone. People have had time to step back. People have had time to learn. Everybody has an opportunity to come back better, you know, smarter, better, more sustainable. I think it's a time to take risks. I think it's a time to collaborate. I think it's a time to focus on community and just become more transparent. And I think that that's, that's really exciting for everyone. So, yeah. <laughs> Listen, guys, I wish we had time for questions. We're gonna try and answer some of those questions in, in uh, the follow-up, but I just wanna say thank you all so much for, for joining us and thank you guys for watching. We appreciate it. We're gonna send it out to everyone by email, social media. You can see us all there, but thanks again. We've loved it. Um, and guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.